Given that high-pressure boilers need to be able to contain an immense amount of pressure, they need to be as rigid and sturdy as possible to ensure that they don't fail. Adding any kind of bend or flexibility would greatly compromise the structure of the boiler and generally be a bad idea. This, however, didn't stop locomotive designers from trying it anyway. As American railroads developed, bigger and bigger engines were needed. However, there was only so big you could make a rigid framed locomotive before it was too big to negotiate bends. This problem was solved in the beginning of the 20th century when the US began using Malay engines. These engines had two sets of powered bogies, with the forward set being able to articulate, allowing them to be much bigger and have more driving wheels while still being able to traverse tight bends. A drawback of the design, however, was that, on bigger locomotives especially, the boiler would overhang when going around bends and the awkward weight distribution because of this resulted in the Malays riding rough on curves and unevenly wearing out the rails. In 1910, Samuel Vuclain of the Baldwin Locomotive Works felt that making the boiler articulate too would help solve some of the Malays' issues. On paper, this wasn't too crazy of an idea. Having the boiler articulate along with the bogey would not only help prevent issues caused by overhang, but also help keep weight on the engine's driving wheels for better traction and weight distribution. On top of this, he also found that the combustion gases would no longer transfer heat to the water after traveling 22 feet through the boiler tubes, meaning that having a super long boiler was inefficient anyway. Knowing this, Vuclain came up with a solution to solve both problems, a flexible boiler. The premise was fairly simple. The rear segment of the boiler connected to the firebox would produce high pressure and superheated steam to be used by a set of high pressure cylinders. The exhaust steam would then be piped into the front boiler where it was reheated and used by the low pressure cylinders. To make the most of the remaining hot gases from the firebox, the front segment also contained a feed water heater too. The two boiler segments sort of slotted together, with a bell-shaped tube protruding from the high pressure end pointing into the low pressure boiler. In order to create a seal, a flexible bellow joint was made by connecting tapered steel rings along their inner and outer edges in an alternating pattern, essentially creating a giant metal accordion. At the time, the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe Railway was in need of powerful and flexible passenger engines and took interest in the articulated boiler design. They took a pair of 262 engines and combined them to make a 2662 locomotive at their engine shops in Topeka in 1910, fitting it with large driving wheels, a Jacobs Schuppert firebox and of course, a flexible boiler. Numbered 1157, initial testing and performance seemed to prove satisfactory, and so the AT and SF ordered an additional two from Baldwin, these numbered 1158 and 1159 respectively, but the Santa Fe wasn't fully convinced of the bendy boiler's benefits. As such, when they put in an order for some more bigger Malays, these being the 3300 class, the AT and SF opted for these to have rigid boilers instead. Four of the Class 3300s, however, were still fitted with articulated boilers, these being numbers 3320 to 3323. While able to do the work they were built for, it wasn't long before the problems with the bendy boiler design made themselves apparent. The first issue was the flexible metal bellows in the middle. Cinders, ash and coal debris would build up in and around the grooves of the bellow, and as such would break the rivets open when the engine rounded a bend. This issue was only present on the first two engines as the rest used a double ball joint to connect the boiler segments, but the joint was far from the only problem with the design. A flexible boiler requires flexible steam pipes, and one can imagine how tricky it was to maintain the dozen or so external pipes carrying high pressure steam along the length of the boiler. Awkward and expensive maintenance seemed to be an issue all of these engines had. It's fair to say it'd be difficult to effectively clean the boiler tubes with an inaccessible gap in the middle of said boiler, and extra, flexible parts only add more complexity and points of failure to an already complex locomotive design. But what really undid the articulated boiler's chances of success was simply that they weren't much of an improvement over a standard, fixed boiler design. 
While crews did find the bendy boiled malleys to be smoother running and that they put less wear and tear on the rails as promised, it was only a mild improvement at best. With so much time and money required to maintain them for so little gain in return, the AT and SF didn't bother building any more articulated boiler malaise. Despite their shortcomings, it seems that the engines were reliable enough for the railroad to continue using them until the 1930s, but contempt for the engines seemed to be common. E.D. Worley was quoted as saying, Pure conjecture is quite insufficient to visualize the thousands of lost machinist and boilermaker hours that were doubtlessly wasted to keep these mechanical abortions on the road. Interestingly, despite their flaws, the Baldwin locomotive works seemed to cling on to the idea, incorporating an articulated boiler into their patented quadruplex and quintuplex locomotives, but these engines remained as just schematics. Articulated boiler locomotives, then, are an interesting footnote in railway history. The fact that someone was able to make a high-pressure steam tank in any way flexible is a remarkable achievement, but all the same, let them be a reminder that, sometimes, the best option isn't always the most flexible one. Subscribe for more.